In this video, let's take a look at what it's going to take to add cooling to our project here. So before we take a look at the different options for building out cooling systems inside of our grasshopper scene, let's take a look at the PHPP and let's see where we stand as far as cooling is concerned. I'm going to come into my grasshopper scene here and let me just shift over to the PHPP. And let's start back at the verification worksheet. So I'm going to shift back to my verification worksheet. Let's talk about cooling. So first of all, when it comes to my annual energy performance results down here in column I, notice that I'm getting some good results for heating demand, peak heating load, primary energy, primary energy renewable. But notice here that I'm not getting any values for cooling and dehumidification energy demand, peak cooling, or peak cooling load. Notice, though, that I am getting some interesting results here for frequency of overheating, that is, percentage of hours above 25 degrees Celsius, uh, this was a 77 uh, degrees Fahrenheit, and frequency of excess high humidity above 12 grams per kilogram, that's, uh, what is that? that's like 60% uh, RH at 77 degrees, I believe. Um, and so these are, these are showing me percentage of hours uncomfortable. So 40% of the hours are uncomfortable, 17% of the hours are too humid, 39% uh, are too hot. Uh, okay, that's, that's, that's bad. That's not good at all. Um, and in addition, we're not getting any cooling energy performance information. So what, what's happening here exactly? Well, by default, every time you open the PHPP, when you open a brand new PHPP, it's going to have what's known as mechanical cooling, we would call air conditioning, active cooling, turned off. The default assumption in the PHPP is that you want to try and provide comfortable conditions for your occupants during the summer months using so-called passive measures. Now that may be perfectly adequate and possible in many climates around the world. Where I work in New York City, it's not possible at all. And so we're always going to have active cooling systems in our passive house buildings. Now, of course, the PHPP can model active cooling systems, but again, they are off by default. So you just need to make sure to turn them on every time. So the reason we're not getting any information here on the energy used for our air conditioning system is that we don't have an air conditioning system. And that's why we have such high overheating here and over humid here in our project as well. Okay, so how are we going to turn on mechanical cooling? Let's say that we're working in a place like New York uh, where we cannot get away with passive cooling. We're going to have to use some sort of active air conditioning and dehumidification system because primarily because of the humidity levels in the summertime. And so we need to turn on mechanical cooling or active cooling. Well, it's quite straightforward. All we need to do is come up here to mechanical cooling. And instead of leaving it blank, we just check it with an X and notice all of a sudden, now here our cooling and dehumidification demand and peak cooling loads are getting calculated. Notice my frequency of overheating zeroes out because if you have an air conditioning system and it's properly sized, then you shouldn't have overheated hours. You should be able to manage those cooling, uh, that cooling energy demand through your air conditioning system. Okay, so that's how we're going to turn it on. We need to turn it on. But again, as we've talked about, we don't, we don't want to set things in the PHPP directly. I want to manage all of that information from back in the PHPP. So, okay, so how are we going to turn on, back in the PHPP, back in the grasshopper scene, I meant to say. So how are we going to turn on mechanical cooling? Well, if we come in here, those are grasshopper scenes. We've got our rooms, our fresh air ventilation, our heating and cooling, domestic hot water, configure the model and export to the PHPP. So if I zoom in here to the heating and cooling section and I come into my heating and cooling systems component, notice that we have an input here for mechanical cooling and it, notice the tooltip here says that it's a Boolean value, so true false. The default is false, meaning that by default air conditioning is turned off and we have, we're going to try and use so-called passive cooling measures. Um, and so if we leave it blank or we set it false, then uh, it'll stay as off. But we could also turn it on by just bringing up a Boolean toggle here. And instead of false, just set it to true. And I'll set that in mechanical cooling. And 
we'll come back to that error in a second. We'll come back over here and notice that mechanical cooling has been turned on. Okay, so pretty straightforward. There's really not much we need to do there. Now notice though we did get some errors here. As soon as we turned on mechanical cooling we got this warning. So let's take a look at the warning here. It says it looks like you do not have cooling equipment hooked up but you do have mechanical cooling enabled. If you want to provide active cooling, be sure to hook up at least one piece of active cooling equipment. So what is this referring to? Well, what it means is, okay, you turned mechanical cooling on, air conditioning, but you didn't actually give me any air conditioning equipment down here to use. So you've told me that you want to use air conditioning, but you haven't given me any actual equipment to, to use. So we need to provide some type of cooling and dehumidification equipment down here, either supply air cooling, recirculated air cooling, uh, dedicated dehumidification, or radiant cooling. Uh, uh, those would be our options for cooling systems. So, okay, fine. So let me give us a little more room here. And how are we going to do that? So let's pull this down a little bit. So how are we going to do that? What kind of cooling system should we give to our project here? Well, the most straightforward um, system, in my experience, is going to be a simple recirculated air cooling system. This would be sort of a, let's call this, this would be a typical air conditioner, which is recirculating air inside of the space. It's taking in air from the space, it's cooling that air, and then it's supplying that air back into the space. Okay, so this would be a very simple, straightforward air conditioning system. Um, this would be the equivalent of a, you know, a, a, a standard heat pump system um, like the one we modeled for our heating side. So, okay, so fine. So we could, you know, we could try and use our supply air, meaning the ERV air. Uh, we could try and provide cooling riding on the ERV air. That's going to be hard because the flow rates are so low, but, you know, we could try it. Um, we could also use radiant uh, panel systems to provide cooling. Obviously, that's going to be really hard in humid locations like um, New York or many parts of the eastern U.S., uh, and so our sort of go-to for most projects in the location I work in, at least, is this recirculated air cooling, uh, sort of typical air conditioning system. So let's take a look at what we have here. So here's our um, typical AC system. It's very simplified input. We're going to provide the type of operation. So um, what do we have here? So if this is left empty, the assumption is that the unit has a variable refrigerant flow. So we can turn that off if we're using a more old-fashioned style of unit that is only a sort of on-off. We could um, we could set this to true. Uh, most modern AC heat pump systems that we're working with are going to use a variable refrigerant flow in order to modulate their capacity. Of course, we have to input a maximum cooling capacity. By default, it's set to 1,000 kilowatts, which is enormous. Um, so obviously, you're going to want to set that to some actual number for, for your project. If it's a, you know, a three kilowatt system, a five kilowatt system, you know, whatever the size of the, the system is that you're using. Um, and then we're going to need to input the volume flow uh, at nominal power. So at, uh, at normal flow rate, what's its, um, what's its uh, air flow in cubic meters per hour? Uh, and then we've got the last couple options here. Is it variable volume? Uh, you know, is, this, is the fan able to modulate uh, itself to uh, adjust the volume of air that flows through the system? And then lastly, what's the, what's the sear of the system? Notice here that this is in watts per watt. So if you're in the U.S. working here, make sure that you don't enter a U.S. sear, which, is, which would be what? Which would be BTUs per hour per watt. Um, so make sure you enter as uh, watts per watt um, uh, the sear value here to make sure that um, uh, that input is uh, flowing through correctly. So, uh, okay, fine. Well, so we got to input some information there. By default, we do get some system. So it's going to be a variable refrigerant system. It does have a modulating fan. It has a sear of three. Remember, that's watts per watt, not BTUs per watt. Uh, and then a nominal volume of 100 cubic meters per hour, nominal capacity of 1,000 kilowatts. That's enormous. So let's see what happens when we just hook that up. So let's take our recirculating air cooling system and let's drop that recirculating air cooling system into the recirculating air cooling system input. Notice our warning goes away. And if we go back to our PHPP, we are now getting some calculated values here. And if we were to scroll over, 
into our cooling units worksheet. So down here in the blue section, we have our cooling units worksheet. And notice in our cooling units worksheet, we have turned on the recirculated cooling and we are currently inputting a system uh, which is running at 1,000 kilowatts and 100 cubic meters per hour at a sear of three with variable air volume uh, and variable refrigerant flow. Okay, fine. So that's the default system, but now we need to check something here. We need to make sure that the system is actually working. So let's come down below and let's take a look down here. So the useful cooling and the, the row that we want to look at here is this unsatisfied demand. The unsatisfied demand is currently at 28.7 kilowatt hours per square meter per year for sensible, 3.9 for latent load. So our system is not working very well at all. Uh, and the reason it's not working very well is it's far oversized for this little house. So first things first, let's go and uh, change the size of this air conditioning equipment. And of course, if we had a specific piece of equipment in mind, we could go check the, we could go, you know, get the actual, the, um, uh, the actual max cooling capacity of whatever the heat pump system is that we're working with here. This is going to be in kilowatts. So three kilowatts, let's go back to our PHPP now. Uh, okay, so that helped. So our unsatisfied demand went down. So by putting in a you know a normal sized um, element here, that went down. And the next thing we want to do is we want to adjust our volume flow rate. So our volume flow rate is only 100 cubic meters per hour. So that's not very much. So what we want to do is have a lot more air move through that system. So let's see how we can uh, adjust. That. So let's go back to let's go back to our PHPP or our, excuse me our grasshopper scene and let's input something more more believable instead of a hundred cubic meters per hour let's say it's like a thousand meters cubed per hour all right so let's input that as the uh, the air flow there. Oh, and of course, remember, you don't have to input that as cubic meters per hour. If you're, again, in the US and you prefer working in CFM, you know, what's 1,000 cubic? So let's say 600 CFM, right? We can always input those as um, uh, um, more as IP units. We'll change this to CFM. And remember, this, uh, this is going to do the conversion there automatically, 600 CFM at 1.7. So yeah, so it's like just over 1,000 cubic meters per hour. So like 600 CFM, right? That would be your, that would be your, uh, your input there for the, the uh, volume flow. Let's see what that did to our unsatisfied demand. Good. OK, so, so a smaller system running more air through it, as you would expect, satisfies your demand much better. So is our cooling demand covered? Yes, it is. We do have a little bit of uncovered latent latent demand. Uh, we could maybe tweak our sizing. Maybe we want to uh, uh, um, adjust this a little bit, use a different piece of equipment um, uh, to, to satisfy the last of that little latent demand. Maybe we want to add additional dehumidification. That would be fine. We could do any of that. But um, uh, in any event, we have, um, as far as PHPP is concerned, within the margin of error, we have satisfied our, our uh, energy demand for our cooling systems. So making the system smaller and then bumping up the flow rate help satisfy the uh, demand for our project. But of course, this is going to be dependent on your project, right? If you're working on a big multifamily project, then you're probably going to need a lot more energy. Um, you know, if you're working on a really tiny project, you need less. So you can obviously input the right information for your system uh, in these in these inputs here. So in any event, this is all now flowing through into our project. So we've set up, we have first of all turned on mechanical cooling, and then we've added some cooling uh, uh, equipment in order to provide the cooling for our project here. So we've, we've uh, at this point, pretty well fully set up our heating and cooling system. I guess the last thing we could do if we wanted to would be to add another heat pump for our domestic hot water system. Remember, we're still using direct electric for our domestic hot water system. That would be fine. We could add another heat pump. And the way we would do that would be quite straightforward. We would just come in here um, and notice we have a whole input for domestic hot water heat pump systems. So I could just grab another air source heat pump. And all I would need to do, maybe I'll name this one domestic hot water heat pump. 
I'll give it a name. And for now, let's just use the default values. I can just use all the, leave those as default for now and just input heat pump there into heat pump hot water. Uh, and so now we've got an electric heat pump for our hot water system, an electric heat pump for our heating system, and an electric heat pump or air conditioner for our cooling system. We've set up all of our various options here, and all of that is flowing through into the PHPP. What does that do to our PHPP? Let's go back to our verification worksheet, and let's see where that lands us here uh, in the end. So heating energy demand of 30 kilowatt hours per square meter per year target of 15. Cooling, de dehumidification, cooling uh, um, and dehumidification energy demand of 33 with a target of 18. That's kilowatt hours per square meter per year. Uh, primary energy demand of 218 kilowatt hours per square meter per year with a target of 120. Now one thing we could do here, actually this is the old, remember this is the old fashioned primary energy. Maybe for our project we actually want to use the new primary energy renewable. So in order to do that I'm going to come over here to my model configuration section. And I'm going to come in here to the energy standard, uh, excuse me, the, what a, not the, this one, primary energy. And, and rather than the default old-fashioned primary energy, I'm going to use the new primary energy renewable. So 2PR renewable. And so let's set that. So my primary energy class is going to be PER. So um, that's going to be very typical for the, the new all-electric uh, style buildings that we're, we're building these days rather than the old PER. So come back to my verification worksheet and notice now, here we go. So now, I, now my targets are being set for PER instead of primary energy. Um, down here in verification of primary energy, notice this has been set to two primary energy removal. So in any event, we have a target of 60 kilowatt hours per square meter per year and we're currently at 106. So we've pretty well fully built out the PHPP at this point. We've got all of our areas and windows. We've got all of our various systems, our, dehumid our um, domestic hot water and our fresh air ventilation system and our heating system and cooling system. We've set up all the configuration. We've got the occupants and the appliances and all that stuff flowing through. Uh, so all of that is working. So these are realistic numbers. These values that we are seeing now are pretty representative of the way that we have the building designed. So obviously those are not such good values. Obviously we are not really hitting our passive house marks. We're just about, you know, double our passive house heating energy demand um, and our primary energy demand there. Um, and so what are we going to do about that? Well, in the next video, what we'll do is come back and we will start to turn our attention to optimizing and improving the performance of our building. There's a couple of very simple things we can do that are going to change the performance characteristics strongly. First of all, we haven't said anything at all to do with air tightness of the building yet. And in addition, we haven't said anything at all to do with the operable windows of the building. So currently, we have no operable ventilation whatsoever. And both of those things are going to strongly affect our uh, both uh, um, uh, cooling performance in terms of comfort levels uh, and, and, of course, the heating energy performance when it comes um, uh, to the air tightness there. So I think in the next video, we'll take a look at how we begin to analyze the PHPP results and then we'll take a look at adding some new components to our grasshopper scene and starting to uh, uh, really dial in the performance. We'll, we'll add in the, the air tightness and the summer ventilation as well.